What's going on my YouTube friends? How we all doing? All my audio enthusiasts, my cold front friends, how we all doing? Uh, I'm sitting here on the 29th. It is a Tuesday and I'm here in Vancouver, British Columbia. And we're kind of gearing up, kind of half waiting for uh, the Freeze the Fall show tonight. And I thought I would talk to you all about my strategy when it comes to prepping for shows like this. Uh, so we're playing at a venue called the Cobalt, which I've never been to before. I don't know anyone who's like gigged there. I know they put on a lot of shows, but I just didn't have any like personal contacts who had performed there before. Um, so I really don't know what I'm walking into. Uh, so I kind of have like a checklist that I roll through and things that I'm gonna consider. Um, and I'm going to try not to bore you all with like a bunch of boring stuff. <laughs> could probably try to do that more often. Um, and I'm going to try not to overcomplicate things too. Um, so typically the first thing I do is I request a set list from the band so I can kind of prepare myself for the order of them. I want to know like what the temples are going to be. And then from there I can start planning like what instruments are going to have to step out at what points. Um, Freeze the Fall is really good for highlighting each of the three musicians. So there'll be sections where it's vocal and guitar heavy. There'll be sections where the bass needs to stand out. There'll be sections where like the drums need to stand out. And even though the general kind of mix that needs to happen has to be able to have everything kind of intelligible like everything needs to be clear it needs to be a solid mix there are points where you know aria's bass steps out and has a solo or quinn's singing on top of like a lead guitar line as it were right like a like a legato guitar line right so these are things that i'm going to prepare myself for as well as we run backing tracks we have bass booms with string sections we have like percussion parts like there's different like kind of keyboard things and drum patterns that happen and i have to make sure that i'm prepared for all those as well so leading up to the show i'll make a playlist in order of their set list and i just listen to the stems and it's pretty boring y'all <laughs> like it's every once in a while you get like a bass boom every once in a while you get some strings but these are kind of important to know where they actually happen in the song and on the record on the actual released versions i don't know what parts are being covered by the band and i don't know what parts are going to be covered by the stems or the tracks right so i want to make sure that i'm prepared for all of those the cobalt from what like i've seen online isn't the biggest venue either so volume is probably going to be a bit of an issue so the first thing we're going to do when we get the band in there is i'm going to backwash quinn's guitar guitar amp we turn it like 180 degrees around and shoot it into a wall or like away from the audience so i don't really want it to be all floor noise that's giving me the guitar tone because not only is it going to be louder on one side of the building and i could offset it by like if quinn's on the like house left side i could pan it to the right side so that side of the pa picks up more of it but you're gonna have two different sounds and once you get past the stage volume and then that that amp hits the front row of the crowd the rest of the room is going to get a different sound than what like the guitar amp actually sounds like, right? So I just turn it right around, spin it backwards. We put two mics on it and uh, I let the PA do his job, right? So um, for the mics, I've talked with Jordan and uh, we he informed me that they use the glue glob on the actual speaker. So there's like a part of the cone that has like where it's actually harnessed together with glue. And so there's one microphone directly on that. That's the main tone. And then I have the second one basically completely different from that so i might put it mid cone i might put it on the very edge depending on what i'm kind of feeling i'm probably gonna go with the very edge is a little bit brighter and i set that mic back 10 milliseconds which is something that we've learned from like the warning ben death's talked to me about stuff like that similar to that in different applications um but it kind of just gives you like a big wall of guitar sound so since we're a three piece we only have one guitar amp i'm trying to make it sound like there's two guitar players effectively right so 10 milliseconds it's still fast enough to be on time um, and it's the supporting side that is uh, delayed that like a few samples basically and that is just to give us like some extra body some extra warmth a little bit more energy and character out of that single guitar amp right um, for the bass we do multiple channels aria has a really nice di like a output on her pedal board and i'll also take something from the bass amp so if they have a mic available i'll put like a beta 52 or an sm 57 on it like it doesn't really matter i'm gonna get out of it what i want um, if the bass head has a direct out like an xlr out then i'll take that as well um, i want at least two channels maybe even three channels of bass just to make sure that we're giving you know the most we can out of a three piece because again we don't have a keyboard player we don't have other instruments to help fill out that like that wall of sound that they want right so for the guitars i went through that for the bass i'll do one that's like quite subby quite like quite a lot of low end the if it's a 57 for the microphone i'll use that for a lot of the attack like in the lives in the live in a live performance it's kind of 800 hertz that gives you like the clarity like the pick noise as it was um aria plays like with her fingers but um you still want that like punchiness of your finger coming off that bass string right um so i'll do that probably off the bass amp 
Um, and then her DI off the floor will probably just be her tone. I don't usually change that too much outside of just making it sound okay in the PA system because PA systems, like I don't, I don't even know what they're using for speakers and they don't exactly sound like what music sounds like, right? Like it's a typically like a three-way, you've got like an 18 or a couple 15s on the bottom for subs and you've got like a two or a three-way top and <clears throat> they have their own they have their own crossover points, right? So where the horn actually speaks, where the tweeter actually speaks, where the, like the 12 or the 10 inch speaker actually speaks is not the same as like a headphone or like near fields in the studio, right? So um, I'm gonna take a listen to the PA and I'm gonna make some decisions based on that. But her DI sound is usually pretty good. That's what's gonna give her like chorus or her overdrive or anything. And it's gonna be the ding wall itself. So I'm not gonna mess with that too much. I'm gonna let that kind of speak for itself. And I'm gonna support it with other things like a sub ear bass or maybe a more high end or more like high mid point. Um, on the mic or something like that, right? For Jonah's drums, Jonah's an animal. Jonah plays the crap out of that drum kit. <laughs> we call him Jonah the Destroyer, right? So a few things I'll have to take a listen to is, like, do we need to push the snare drum uh, through the mains like a whole bunch? Um, there are things that need to happen. Like if the drummer, if Jonah's offset to one side, he'll need to be balanced just the same as I was saying, like with the guitar amp and it's natural noise. Um, but a snare drum, like they're aggressive, right? And when you hit it, the first like initial sound of it goes straight up and then it'll go out right so that i've found in some smaller clubs is enough but then i can't use my reverbs if i've got the snare drum mic off so what i'll do is i'll run it in pre-fader mode where the auxiliary sends don't uh or aren't affected by the fader volume so i can have the fader off but i can still feed a reverb and you can still get that like God, that carries out like a room or a cathedral or something like that right um so i'll probably ex like try back and forth between the two i'm hoping that because here's the other problem like sound checking in a room without a bunch of meat bodies in it <laughs> a bunch of meat bags in it it sounds a lot different than when it's full or when it's packed or when it's half full or whatever right so if we end up starting with that i'm okay with that and i can bleed in like the tones after we're also the opening band so i don't want to come out and just be like the loudest thing possible i want to make sure that it's pleasing right so um reverb is imp important on a snare drum and uh, one way or another i'll get it like i say if it's pre-fader or if the venue is like large enough or the pa system is big enough that it can kind of handle all that then that's no problem as well um toms are something that's going to be dominant in it like there's a lot of really intricate fills that jonah plays that i got to make sure are intelligible and they still keep time as we move through because like if you have kick snare kick snare and then it goes to a big tom fill you don't want that to feel like an energy drop off right so i got to make sure that toms are going to be up and present um, toms aren't as loud as say a snare drum so they definitely will be in the mix lots of top end in the toms um, and from there we should be in pretty good shape uh for effects and stuff i'll have a drum reverb and then i'll have a vocal reverb beside it like a secondary one so that the two aren't sharing they're not going to be the same sounds and i usually run two delays if the console that i get only has like room for one delay then that's okay i'll do something with like a tap tempo on it and i'll change it to quarter notes for the for like the bpm um sometimes i like to do like a long one, like I'll do a whole note or a dotted whole note or something that's kind of like fun to fill out space. So Quinn hits a big note and then it goes into like an instrumental and I can have that vocal still ringing out. And these are all things that I'm prepping by listening to that set list, right? So I know that when we go into Bloody Mary, I have a quarter note delay that finishes some of the phrases and the verses, right? So I'll know that I'll have to tap that out to the metronome. Um, before they kick into that song right so whenever the song before that i don't have the set list in front of me whenever the song before that is ending or it just ends and they go into their crowd banter i'll prep that delay get that ready etc cetera, etc cetera. it's also a bass heavy song so i know that i'll be prepared with that bass mic or that bass amp di the one that's more pointy um and be ready to you know make sure the bass is real intel intelligible and guiding the performance at that point too right um, another trick that I like to do for backing vocals, and this is like a standard thing. This isn't like something that I invented. Uh, but when you have a vocal with a reverb and a delay, what I do is I take that delay and I feed that into the same vocal reverb, right? If it's the same unit, like in the analog days, you would get feedback from that. Um, if it was like a dual channel, like a reverb and delay unit, then you might get feedback from that. But uh, in the digital consoles these days, they don't seem to have an issue with that. So the routing would look like the reverb, the delay, and then from the delay, you have an auxiliary send back into that reverb. So now it's matching the tone that I've built from the lead vocal, right? And your vocal delay, you typically want less EQing, like you want a less of an available spectrum on the delay feedbacks. 
sorry, I'm using that word in kind of two different contexts here. So when the delay actually happens, you don't want that in the way of the lead vocal. So I'll usually do like a high pass and a low pass and get it kind of more mid focused and you can just kind of hear it as an effect in the background. But I don't want it to be like a soaked reverby vocal and then the, the, the delay comes on and each delay feedback has um, sorry about the camera, it's kind of shifting in and out here. Um, it's just like dry and present and in your face, right? So I'm gonna route that into the reverb as well so it matches the tonal qualities of the lead vocal. Um, so those are just kind of a few things that I'm gonna do in preparation of the night. Um, I also like to, because it's a triple bill, we're the first band on, that means we're gonna be the last band to sound check so that we're just ready to roll when it's showtime, you go in reverse order. Um, I'm gonna make sure that I'm there for the previous band sound check so that I know or I get a head start on what the sound system sounds like, what they're kind of competing with, what the like overall mood of the night's gonna be. Um, Cause like I said, I don't wanna come in there and be 10 times louder than the next two bands, especially as the opener, right? Or the first up at least. This is more like a triple bill. Um, so these are all just things that I consider and uh, a little bit of how I prepare for a show. And um, I hope a lot of that makes sense. I hope that like the theory behind that and the strategy behind that is kind of clear. Um, I've been really inspired lately. I went to a 21 Pilots concert a couple weeks ago. I got to see The Warning for the first time a couple weeks or yeah, two weeks ago now. And they, they just did a really good job of capturing like a small band with some extra parts kind of added in, but just giving you that life of that small band. So like a two piece in 21 Pilots, a three piece in The Warning. Um, vocals are present, like harmony's gotta be present. You gotta make sure that the vocal mics are like ducked when they're not singing so you don't get too much bleed, but you wanna make sure they're available in case, say Jonah starts talking into the microphone. I don't wanna miss the first four words. These are all things that I kind of have to prepare for as well. Um, luckily with a band like Freeze the Fall, they like actually have programmed into their set list where the crowd banter kind of starts and ends so that I can prepare for that stuff too. Um, but yeah, working with the Freeze the Fall team is a lot of fun. Um, tech dad, Craig, is uh, very hands-on uh, when it comes to all the gear and stuff. Like he's built their monitor racks and their um, playback rig and everything. So he'll be running most of the monitors and he'll let me know if he needs anything. He's also got a really good ear when it comes to the mix. So he'll ask me for things like if he wants the kick drum to be a little bit like lower, like sub ear, lower EQ -E, he'll come and tell me that and we can address it. Um, yeah, I have no idea what I'm walking into. These are all the things I'm going to be prepared for and uh, a little bit of how I prepare for a live show. Hope you guys enjoyed. We'll catch you on the next one.